along the plains of western Siberia 8,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer populations constructed some of the oldest known forts in the world. The defensive perimeters of the forts included ditches and walls made of dirt that were several meters high. Atop these earthen walls were wooden palisades. Within these fortifications were several pit houses, which were ideal constructions to trap warmth during winters. Altogether, around several dozen people could live in these fortified communities. These fortified settlements were often built on land that would jut out into bodies of water, or upon naturally elevated parts of the terrain. Placements like these would have commanded the surrounding terrain, and also would have enabled the builders to see fishing opportunities. The area of western Siberia today is incredibly remote, and is only accessible by boat or helicopter, both of which can take several days to reach the location. The region was far removed from the various parts of Eurasia that were experiencing the agricultural revolution. In fact, the developments of the revolution never reached the region until the modern era. It has long been assumed among laymen and archaeologists alike that a society had to practice agriculture before developing the need to build permanent structures and to have social stratification. However, due to the discovery of the forts in Siberia and other similar sites around the world, these views are changing. The earliest of the fort structures were created 2,000 years before anything of the sort was built anywhere else in the world. They predate the towering stone walls of Uruk and Babylon in the Middle East, and they even predate the advent of agriculture in parts of Europe and Asia. Though other contemporaneous hunter-gatherer societies are known to have built forts, they did so near coastal areas. In contrast, the Siberian forts are unique in that they were built by hunter-gatherers within inland regions. The building of forts has been a long-lasting feature of Siberian culture, as the indigenous peoples of Siberia were still using them by the time of the Russian conquests of Western Siberia in the 16th and 17th centuries. The hunting-gathering lifestyle of Western Siberia also has been a long-lasting feature, as it lives on today in the Ninets and Kanti peoples, whom still partially practice hunting and gathering. The region between the Ural Mountains and the Yenisei River, where the forts have been found, is covered in pine forest and rivers, with patches of permafrost and swamps. The region is abundant with food like fish, aquatic birds, forestfowl, elk, and reindeer. Archaeologists think that 8,000 years ago, the abundance of food in the region supported a large population, which in turn began interacting in complex and competitive ways, as it grew ever larger. From the available foods, the Siberians likely produced fish oil, fish meal, dried and smoked fish, dried birds, and frozen meats, as these are all still made by the indigenous groups of western Siberia. Archaeologists think that the production of these goods not only required the hunter-gatherers to build permanent production centers, but also would have made these locations targets for raiders, seeking to steal such valuable already prepared to eat food. To protect themselves from these raiders, the Siberians making the frozen food would have built defenses. There is also strong evidence that these fortified settlements had socially stratified societies, as evidenced from the varying sizes of the pit houses. Many of these larger pit houses were also located on elevated land relative to the other pit houses. At one of the fortification sites, many of the pit houses were located outside of the perimeter of the defenses, which is a clear sign of social stratification, as the elites would have dwelt within the perimeter, while the commoners of the society would have dwelt outside of it. A site called Amnia 1 is the farthest north of the fortified settlements, and is also the oldest fortified settlement in the world. Researchers used the radiocarbon method to date wood and charcoal found at the settlement's earliest layers of sediments, and came back with the 8,000 years ago date. Sitting along the lower Ob River, at the very end of a section of land that juts out into a swamp, stood ten pit houses surrounded by banks, ditches, and a wooden palisade. Nearby to the east is the Amnia II site, which consisted of ten pit houses that were unfortified. 
The floor plan of the pit houses were rectangular and were around 1.8 meters deep. Researchers also discovered that the settlement had been destroyed by fire and rebuilt multiple times, which highly suggests that it had been attacked multiple times by raiders. Arrowheads have also been found in the surrounding defensive ditches, which further indicates signs of warfare. Further suggesting an increase in the social complexity of the fortified settlements is the fact that they also began making pottery at around this time. Two types of pottery dominated, ones that were created by etching designs into the still drying clay, and the other which consisted of using tools to stamp or indent designs on the clay. Additionally, the pottery may have also been used to store the frozen and dried food. Most of the stone blades found at the site were made from quartz, with a few made from flint, while projectile points were made from slate. Fire pits and fireplaces inside the pit houses suggest that the settlement was occupied continuously. Though these societies lived in permanent communities, they still practiced their lifestyle of hunting and gathering by transporting their collected resources to their walled enclosures. As of now, around seven other forts have been discovered by archaeologists throughout western Siberia. The archaeologists who worked on the findings have three theories for why the Siberians suddenly began constructing forts and engaging in the social stratification of their societies. 8,200 years ago, as the earth rapidly cooled, the once abundant resources of western Siberia may have partially disappeared. This may have compelled the peoples of the region to begin hoarding and preserving the resources. However, there is also evidence to suggest that Siberia experienced a warming event, which may have led to a dramatic increase in the population of fish and elk, and other important food staples. In response to this, the Siberians may have begun hoarding the surpluses of resources all the same to increase their social standing and wealth within their societies. The third theory is that the changing climates led to the movement of new populations into western Siberia, who then shared their hitherto unknown technology, such as fishing traps, with the native inhabitants. This new technology may have increased the efficiency at which game was hunted and stored, which in turn could have led to individuals accumulating power that then compelled competitors to violently challenge them. One of the most profound implications of the archaeologists' findings and their theorizing is that social stratification, complex architecture, and technological innovation were all developed by the Siberians even though they never adopted agriculture. The implication is that the three elements may possibly have been developed by other societies throughout the world before they adopted agriculture. The assertion taught in schools that the three elements of social stratification, complex architecture, and technological innovation are all always developed after the adoption of agriculture may be an oversimplification and a falsehood. The very idea of the concept of the hunter-gatherer is challenged as well, as in the popular imagination and even among scientists, peoples leading this way of life are seen as continuously moving from one place to the next. Additionally, the landscape bearing these peoples is often viewed as sparsely populated with plenty of resources to go around, and therefore negating any need for warfare. The finds in western Siberia challenge these notions, as now it is clear that the groups who built the forts were incredibly territorial and probably had certain hunting and foraging grounds staked out as their territory that was to be defended. Incredibly, Western Siberia is also remote and far removed from the major centers of cultural and technological innovation in Afro-Eurasia and in the Americas. This cuts into the notion that a society had to be nearby other complex societies to absorb their ideas. In fact, the agricultural revolution, which was getting underway by the time the Siberian forts were constructed, never reached the remote region of western Siberia, yet the Siberians still created societies that had large sedentary populations, monumental architecture, and social stratification. Some archaeologists now contend that there were likely alternate pathways that a society could take to become a complex permanently settled society, and that agriculture was no longer a prerequisite. For example, in the Anatolia region, there is the Gobekli Tepe monument that was built in around 9000 BC, 
But in this case, the peoples of the region were already beginning to adopt agriculture. However, there are numerous other examples from around the world that more closely parallel the societies of the Siberian forts. 10,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer communities in coastal regions like the Korean Peninsula, the Japanese islands, and Scandinavia made heavy use of resources from the sea to support large permanent communities. Additionally, in the Pacific Northwest region of North America, societies have been discovered whom sometimes created fortified permanent settlements sustained by hunting and gathering. For the longest time, Hunting and gathering peoples who practice aspects of society traditionally associated with agriculturally based societies were seen as outliers from the main progression of hunting and gathering first, agriculture adoption second, and then followed by social stratification and monumental architecture. However, this notion is changing, and more scientists are beginning to accept a more complex framework where many societies may in fact have advanced greatly without agriculture, or even that the societies that did adopt agriculture early on may already have been socially stratified as hunter-gatherers. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed my documentary, don't forget to like and subscribe, and check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash world chronicles.